Hello everyone, I'm Boyd Hilton. Um, it's my great honour to uh, present this very special BAFTA session. Welcome to the making of the end of the fucking world, part of BAFTA television The Sessions, a virtual series to celebrate some of the nominees and nominated programmes from this year's Virgin Media British Academy Television Awards and the British Academy Television Craft Awards, which happened on Friday, of course. I want to say a huge thanks to our sponsor TCL for helping with this. And um, here's some um, housekeeping rules to start with. These virtual events are part of BAFTA's learning work to share expertise from TV, film and games with audiences far and wide. Check out BAFTA.org and BAFTA's social channels for more activity and news. We stream this event on YouTube live and you'll be able to rewatch there as well and join the conversation on social using hashtag BAFTA TV sessions. And you can ask your questions. I'm gonna be asking questions to start with and then at the end, we'll make sure we leave enough time for your questions and please send them in via the Q&A function on Zoom or on YouTube if you're watching there. Closed captioning is also available now, which you can turn on at the bottom of your screen. And um, as we're lucky to have so many of the team from uh, the end of the fucking world joining us today, we've split the session into two parts. So please welcome our first speakers, who are Charlie Cavell, the writer, and of course, a breakthrough Brit. Welcome, Charlie. Hey. Hello. Lucy Forbes, who's the director of episodes one to four of series two. Hi, Lucy. Hello. Naomi Aki, who is the actor, of course, who played Bonnie and was nominated for Best Supporting Actress at the BAFTA Awards. Welcome, Naomi. Oh, have you got your audio on, Naomi? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, oh, yes. Good. Just part. checking. Just checking. <laughs> Carmel Cochran, the casting director. Hi, Carmel. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and Ed McDonald, exec producer. Hi, Ed. Hello there. Hello. Right. Now then, let's start, um, Charlie, by, I guess, um, the obvious question talking about, first of all, congratulations on getting the series itself nominated for a second time for a BAFTA. I remember when you talked about series one, you, you said you weren't expecting it to be such a huge thing. You felt it was kind of like quite a small, you know, indie-ish series. And now this is your second time round for series two. How did you feel when you heard that you've been nominated, the show been nominated, and um, what level of surprise was was there from you for that? I couldn't believe it. Yeah, I mean, I thought um, it was it was a real shock, a nice shock, but it was you know a huge surprise, I think. Um, but you know, we had this, we had an amazing team, second time round as well. So I'm I'm thrilled, and yeah, really delighted for Naomi as well. Absolutely. Congratulations, Naomi. Um, I guess the the main difference between series one and two, I mean, it started out as, as the um, comic strip, graphic novel, etc. Then there was a short made, wasn't there? Then series one. But now series two came along and they're, they're, you've run out of source material. So did you know what you wanted to do with that second series as soon as you were working on series one? Or did that come gen generally, uh, gently and gradually? Or did you have a kind of firm idea of what you wanted to do? Um, it took quite a long time. Um, I think, would be, to be perfectly honest, I think we've said this before. Um, uh, I say look, we as in us, not the royal we. But, you know, I think um, I didn't think there would be a second series because, you know, like you said, we thought we were making this tiny thing. Um, we thought about 12 people would watch it. And the end was ambiguous, but I suppose possibly not ambiguous in the sense that you had the graphic novel it was based on and and when we were asked if we wanted to do a second season we talked about it for quite a long time because we didn't want to just say yes you know without knowing what we wanted to do and it took a it took a long time it took the best part of what was it I think Ed it was another two years between the first and the second yeah <clears throat> and a lot of a lot of tears and <laughs> sweat and pet yeah but um but the but the thing that kind of unlocked it i think for for us was that you know it was really important to it sounds it sounds really heavy but um i think with you know with the first series thematically it is quite a quite a dark show even though it's funny but um you know the themes we deal with as in the graphic novel are quite serious ones and i think it felt that we had to deal with what had happened to Alyssa and james to do to do the story justice and 
so that was so thinking about that was important and unlocked where we were going to go in the second series and then also the character of Bonnie was key to kicking off this this new story um and Bonnie was actually a character that we based on one of Chuck's characters from the graphic novel so Bonnie was always rooted to the source material um and so it felt like an authentic continuation of 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 Chuck's kind of world if that if that makes sense mm. You did take the, I would say, the bold decision to open series two with the episode almost entirely about Bonnie and, and showing, introducing us to her and her world. Was that always um, on the cards for you, or did you have any? Did you think maybe you should kind of weave in the older characters that we know, we knew from series one as well? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we always knew we wanted a standalone episode just about about Bonnie, and I think um, at one point we thought maybe it would come in episode three or four. Um, and then I think we like we were excited with the idea of starting off the series with a totally new character. And then as soon as we cast Naomi, we we're like, well, we we definitely should because, you know, she's just completely extraordinary. This performance is amazing. Lucy directed this brilliant episode, and it was like if there ever been, been any doubt that it was wrong to start off with that episode, as soon as we saw the kind of rushes from the first day, it was like obviously that's what we're going to do. So. Ed and Ed and Lucy, were you fully behind the, the idea to bring? name his character in from the start and make that first episode such a bold departure in a sense in terms of bringing in the new character and the new story. Yeah, I think, I think well, I'll let Lucy speak for herself in a second, but I think we, um, at the development stage of it, <clears throat> the, the episode moved around a bit, but I think it only ever moved around because we were slightly second guessing ourselves and um, it felt like um, maybe we were, um, th th it would have been, it would have been the sort of conventional thing to do to sort of, or safer thing to do to push it back um, into the, you know, open on Alex and Jess, James and Alyssa, bringing back the characters that we sort of know and love. But I think we just kept coming back to it being a sort of itch we wanted to scratch and it being a sort of braver, more interesting, more dynamic and more surprising opening to the, the second series. So then I think when, and yet still kind of weirdly rooted and grounded in, in material, the source material and also elements of the first series. So. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, Lucy. I don't know how you what you, what you felt coming to the the first few scripts, but you know, for, for us, that was that was just sort of the way it was. I mean, I think I don't think there was ever really. And I know we were umming and ahhing it, but I think once we made the decision, it was a really exciting decision that was made. And you know, the big challenge was making a show that everyone really knew and loved and had a really strong identity, and making that identity across a you know brand you know bring that identity and making an episode without the sort of heart of the show without Jess without Alyssa and James feel like the show and that was the that was the biggest challenge and for me the sort of one of the most enjoyable things about the show is sort of you know all those all those tiny decisions all those all those layers of choices to make it feel like the show it was like it was a sort of it was, you know, constantly going, does this feel like the show? Does this feel like the show? Is this the show, you know? And it was, it was sort of really enjoyable. It was just sort of, you know, really breaking down, really breaking down the first series and then building it back up again and making sure, you know, we wrote a bunch of rules and really, really stuck to them um, to make sure the show felt the show. And then we had the amazing Naomi who just brought this most sort of powerful, subtle, amazing performance and sort of, you know, was so was so amazing right from the get go that you know it was definitely the right decision to make, and it was so exciting. You know, seeing that story slowly come together, played out in the first episode. You know, it was a it was thrilling. It was definitely thrilling to watch as well. And and Carmel, can I come to you in terms of when you read about read the, about the character of Bonnie? How, how did you go about casting that this kind of incredibly strong character? What what how did you how did you go about it? Um. I can't remember if I'd seen Naomi in it. So Naomi had auditioned for St. Maud, a film that we did. And I can't remember if it was before that or, uh, yeah, so, and I'd watched um, Lady Macbeth and I remember watching it. And then I think Charlie had messaged and said, oh, this is the concept. And straight away, I was like, Naomi Aki, kind of from day one. And, and incidentally, that was kind of a similar thing to what happened on the pilot you know, pre-Alex, um, I'd met Dom and Jonathan in, in Soho and uh, they pitched the idea and I'd said, oh, well, the character's Jess. So I guess I've just got some weird sixth sense that works. <laughs> <laughs> 
And Naomi, let's bring you in. What was what was the process like for you when you when you were sent the script and you were approached about the character? What, what was your initial thought? It was. I, it it took a second, I think, of like <laughs> Carmel and like and Lucy in the audition to figure out what Bonnie needed. Like, how was she of service to the story? Um, and that that was always interesting because it felt like I was like slightly adjusting the character in relation to the people around her. And what I figured out with Bonnie was that the way to figure her out was in relation to other people first and then work inwards um, to find her emotional world. So it kind of, like many of like, auditions are so hard because I think most people are usually in relation, are themselves in relation to someone else. And so it, it worked as soon as like Lucy and me and Jess and Alex kind of like started rehearsing it. And then when Destiny came on as well, the same thing and talking to Charlie and everyone, then suddenly it was like, okay, this character is starting to make sense because of the collaboration and because of a deeper understanding of what the story needed. And did you watch series one and did you take, you know, in terms of the performances from, from many from the leads in series one and think influence how you're going to do it to some yeah. extent? Yeah, totally. Cause it's like, it's one of the best shows ever because it's so clear like you know the tone like you can read it and so like me as an actor I was like oh I understand that like I might not necessarily know how to mimic it but I know I knew what that thing was and so that was a really good foundation for me to be like okay the first key words for me were like okay it's quite deadpan humor but the humor is like really grounded in what's real not trying to make anyone laugh um characters who are okay with being unlikable so like all of these things were popping around in my head and then it was just about like consolidating that into every given scene I was given and seeing how we could play with it and have a bit of fun within the rules we made for ourselves. Charlie do you remember thinking seeing Naomi what was your first thought when you saw Naomi um, initial performance and how was it was it what you were thinking of when you were I off the video. No, it, was a, it was a it was a lot it was a lot better it was just amazing I remember thinking like I remember actually talking about the the process of casting um because you know I remember because I was like oh I don't really you know I've got ideas of what she is and Lucy was like you have to relax because we will find someone who can do this and they will be better than you can imagine it but it has to become real because you do worry you're like well can we this is quite a, a, a you know an extreme part and there are ways of performing this that might not work and you know all the things you worry about with with casting and stuff and and also knowing that you find so much with the actor like you know I think I've I think I've bored on about this before but like you know as soon as like because I was still writing the second half of the series and when we were shooting the first half of the first series and it was so much easier knowing that Alex and Jess were playing those parts. So you're like, oh, thank God, I know how they're going to deliver this. And so that with Naomi, I was like, oh, that's, there it is, it's brilliant. And then you relax and go, well, now it's a kind of collaboration with this actor and you can talk about stuff and Naomi's finding stuff that I, you know, we didn't know was there. Um, so yeah, like delight was my reaction, to be honest, delight and huge relief. <laughs> <laughs> And Lucy, in terms of you talked a little bit about the rules that you that you established um, for the series. Was that was moving it from series one to two? Was there were the rules different? Did you bring in new some new ideas and new ways of doing it for the second series? Well, it's sort of so we we come to them sort of uh, we're two years on. The, the characters are two more years two years more fucked up, um, and so it's just ultimately for me I. I I just, I like to work with a set of rules and then I feel like if you write really strong rules and if you don't break them, then the show will feel like the show, the show, show will have a certain tone. So as I sort of already said, I just really, really broke down series one and sort of went down loads of wormholes trying to work out where those references or the references were originally used came from and then built in a bunch of other new things to sort of move it on into the next series. So, you know, you know, it's one of those shows where every single tiny thing is important. You know, the costumes are really important. Production design is really important. Um, locations are really important. Like every the music's really important. Every every tiny aspect was so important. But the most important important thing was the performance, and that's the thing that I really learned on this show is that you know we we spent you know months and months sourcing props and finding locations, and you know all those things were incredibly important. But then sometimes we'd come down to it, we'd have three minutes to shoot a scene and the colour of that chair in the background didn't matter anymore. Ultimately, the most 
thing <laughs> was that the performances were amazing. And that's, you know, why we were so lucky to have it's such an amazing cast. We we're lucky to have Naomi and Jess and Alex and all the surrounding performances because, you know, even under extreme pressure, um, you know, we still got those performances because, you know, you can, you know, the world is so important you build around it. But if the audience don't believe those performances, don't believe, you know, if there's not naturalism in what you're delivering, you know, then the spell, the spell's broken. Mm. Carmen, I want to ask you about the casting of the of the of all the other roles because this is a show, isn't it, where almost every supporting role has a little star-making moment. So I'm thinking of you know the chemist and all of these these people are just extraordinary kind of detailed people. And also, I feel um, it feels like a very diverse and representative cast. Was that important? You know, for a show set in essentially rural England, was that an important thing to do? Was that a hard thing to achieve? Uh, it wasn't hard because I mean, like I'm brown and I want that reflected on on screen. So I think that it was always a conscious thing in the back of my mind of, uh, yeah, we just see the best people and cast the best people, and that was that. Yeah, that was always very um, prominent. I I think Lucy and I had a discussion at the beginning where I said, look, yes, Alex and uh, you know all the all the leads are all really important. Casting Bonnie is really important, but actually it's the day players that we need to have time to cast them because that done wrong can bring a whole show down. And I, I watch things all the time and you just think, oh, you know, well, they left that till <laughs> the, the day before. Um, and again, every, I mean, I, everyone, everyone auditioned, I think, didn't they? Yeah, we didn't offer, you know, and that's something that's really important to me. And that was the same on C, um, the first series we kind of treated it like a family. Everyone came in and auditioned and if they didn't get the part that they came in for, we ended up finding them other roles in the show. And so you ended up with this team that really supported the creative and just really wanted to be part of it, even you know before it was what it was. Do you remember, because actually, well, Destiny can speak to this as well when we speak to her, but it was um, Divian who came in for, I can't even remember which part, and we were just like, you we have in. to write something for him. Yeah, he came in for the for the chemist that that he did that playing, and he wasn't yeah, yeah, the yeah. role. But we were just like, "Who is this guy?" and and um, how do we get him in the show? And then we, yeah, we all sort of had a chat and and found a found a spot for him in episode yeah. seven, and came up with with Sid. So yeah, and it was just it was it was really cool to be able to do that. And like you know, Carmel being open to going, well, you know, like what what is this like? What kind of role could we could we write for him? And it was just yeah, it was a really good collaborative experience, I think. And I think it was important for me as well not to have the kind the same faces that you see in everything. That is always really important in anything that I do. I kind of don't want you, you know. I think as well by the second series there were a lot of names that were kind of being handed to us on a plate, and it just didn't feel like that was our show. You know we we started casting when nobody wanted to be in it. <laughs> <laughs> you never said that. You never said it like that. <laughs> this old shit. No, you can't get, you can't get them for love or money. Who? Who are you? Who are they? <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the style and look of the show, the music and the production design and the cinematography. All of it feels, um, as I think Lucy was saying, so on point, it feels like it's all coming together to create this unique mood. Ed, was that, did you almost take it on a step, I feel like from series one that, you know, the, the, I'm thinking of things like the design of the diner, the cafe with that amazing red neon line going across it and the buildings, all the buildings look incredible. Like where Todd lives looks incredible. Um, it was <laughs> all very, just hard work coming up with all that, make ways yeah, to make it unique. It is hard work and, and, and it's a real sort of uh, team effort. There's, there, there's, there's like a, there's a real sort of clear and precise um, look and feel and tone of the show that's quite hard to articulate. And I think the, the trap um, going into the second series would have been to figure out what people liked about the first series and then sort of like double down on it. And I think we felt like that's like, that would be, you know, that's the risky run going into a second series. I think what we wanted to do is kind of progress and mature and um, elevate it in, in, in some way. And I think um, the idea was to, to take it to a, a ever so slightly more kind of wild and darker place um, and um, to sort of chime with the, 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 the sort of, you know, the, the sort of 
maturation of the characters and the, and the more sort of existential stuff that they were facing as we, as we went through the series and the fallout of events from the first series, which were so profound and kind of catastrophic for, for, for them. Um, but so, so I think, um, yeah, I think it was, you know, a fantastic team, you know, product directors, production design, um, uh, you know, Graham Coxon came back and did such a fantastic job on the music. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just a case of um, using one's kind of judgment and not over-egging it and trying to do something a little bit different, but staying true to what it is that everyone loves about the show, really. Charlie, how much of all of that stuff is in your scripts? Is do you do you talk about the look of the show, the the design of it, and the music at all, or any of those things in the script, or is that does that come later in your creative? Yeah, process? I think. I, yeah, I think I probably, I think I annoy people by being like this track now. I was like, oh, A, it's too expensive. No, it's wrong. But I just put it in anyway and send, you know, a sort of like control freak playlist along with everything. So people really appreciate that. And, um, but I think, and also I should say as well, because, I, you know, yes, I write it, but also Ed, Andy and Emily, you know, we storyline it all together. So it's a very collective kind of writer's room that, that we do. So all of the creation of the second series was a, was very much a, an effort. Um, um, and with Dominic as, as well. So I think, um, but to answer your question, I, yes, I think in the very first series, because I had the short film for reference and John Entwistle would show me, um, you know, frames from the from the comic book he wanted to kind of put on screen. And so we got into this language of writing some visuals for what it would look like. And I did that a bit going into it. And then, you know, Lucy and Destin and I would, talk and say do you really mean that do you need that and I'd be like oh no no it's just a, a sense of something um so yeah I sometimes write it in but it's more so people know what's in my head rather than expecting it to literally be executed like that because I'm not a total nightmare I can be but <laughs> but also sorry I'd just add that Charlie's being quite modest because I think um the, her, the if you ever read the scripts to the show that there's such a sort of like precise deadpan tone to them that is so reflective of the end result on screen. Um, and so I think that massively helps anyone, any sort of HODs, directors, whoever coming on board and, and to get a sort of quick sense um, of what, uh, you know, Charlie's going for. It's just all there in, on, on, on the page, um, which is such a skill and a talent, I think, in a writer. Naomi, as an actor in the middle of that, does it, does it take time to get to the point where you feel you're you're, you know, at one with that tone, getting that, as you, you call it, deadpan as well. Or was it, did that, or was it, did you feel as soon as you started, you you kind of, you had that, and you had that kind of tone? No, 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 it grows, it grows over time. Like you, by the end, I felt way more confident than I did at the beginning. And then you're like, ah, oh, shit, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> but I think like it was always handy. And like, it's that, again, that's where the collaboration comes in so well, because like with Lucy, for instance, I mean, F that B became our thing, which, stood for fuck that bitch um so like whenever she needed me to reach like a certain level of like bonnie crazy mm -hmm. um, that was there like it's like building a shorthand with the people that you work with to really not only like uh, understand what you want to do but how you can incorporate everyone else's um needs in with your performance because essentially like i guess it's that weird thing isn't it like yes it's a, a, a performance is a performance but a performance is nothing without everything else involved and I think that's what the show does so well is you can see everything it's so clear that there's a, a high level of skill involved in everyone's work that you know I, I felt very even when I felt nervous I felt very supported um within that artistry so yeah and Lu Lucy because it's true isn't it that, that 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 Bonnie goes from we see her vulnerabilities um, and the trauma she's gone through, certainly, you know, it went with her mother and all those things, which I found incredibly powerful. And then by the end, she's terrified, isn't she? She's kind of, you know, when she confronts confronts Alyssa in the cafe, etc. She has to go through a lot of quite a, quite a lot of emotions, and yet being quite a deadpan in the middle of all of that. Uh, yeah, but I mean that that just shows how what an amazing job Naomi did because she just got those subtleties so, so beautifully on screen because you know ultimately as a character that you sort of feel really sorry for, you really sort of feel for at the beginning, but then, in, then you completely understand why. So it was just amazing to have a character that you feel increasingly scared of, but sort of can relate to her. 
and sort of I thought Naomi just tracked it so unbelievably beautifully across the series and you know you really really do start to feel scared of her and there's so, there's so many sort of beautiful subtleties in her performance which I enjoyed so much there's this moment when I think this was like the first day that we filmed. This is my, like, genuinely, this is such a tiny thing, but it's one of my favourite things in the show. I think it was just the first day, and I think Charlie was on set, and it was the day we were like, yes, Naomi! Like, it was just such a, ah! <laughs> uh, and it was sort of with, um, we were doing the scenes with Clive, and he was calling you his little salmon. Salmon. <laughs> but there was, before that bit, there's a bit where Clive pours you, Clive pours you a drink and sort of turns round and we see this sort of like quite wide shot of you standing in the sitting room and you literally look like a lamb about to be slaughtered and you do this tiny, tiny thing with your hand and you see the tension coming out I mean, just, and you, you probably didn't notice you were doing it, but you, your, your hand does this as he hands you the drink and it was just such a tiny thing as in like you can see all the tension of the moment coming out in your hand and like there were so many beautiful things like so many, like there were so many extra little layers and um, nuances to, to the performance that just carried it through. It was, it was amazing. And Liz, do you remember that scene in the audition? The salmon, this, yes. oh, just. Oh, yeah. that, again, that, that, again, that just goes to sort of show what an amazing job Naomi's done because usually the sort of scenes that you do in the castings are sort of the most tired scenes by the time you get to set. They're, they're usually really, really hard to get right. And again, and that was one that we'd done over and over and over again during the castings, and it just came together. So, you know, Clive and Bonnie, Jonathan, Jonathan, Naomi just did such a such a good job. Uh, yeah, we were. I mean, everyone. A poor, poor Jonathan. Um, he plays Clive Cock. I mean, everyone was like, ah! on set constantly, like squirming as he walked into the room. Uh, <laughs> And such we, a nice man, such a nice so man. Nice. Such a nice man. So a treat of a man. But I remember, I remember in uh, when when Naomi came in for her for her callback and she did that scene and the way that the office studio downstairs is, and she absolutely nailed it. And I had to turn to face the wall so that I didn't smile and give it away. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, did I walk you out? And you, yeah, you did walk me. <laughs> yeah, but you also like when I, when I came in, you were like you were like. Do it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try. <laughs> but yeah, I remember kind of just feeling this kind of overwhelming happiness in, wow. in the audition room of like, yeah, she's she's great. Um, before we are going to have the awkward moment where I have to move from you, you guys to the next team. Um, but I want to ask, I want to ask Naomi, first of all, what, how did you feel when you were told you'd been nominated for this role? And hey, what, what I was in bed. I okay, genuinely didn't even know it was happening because of all the other things happening in the world. Uh, I woke up to so many texts of congratulations. I was like, what's going on? And then I saw it and I was like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. And then I just started, you know, crying because that's what I do to absorb things. But it's, it's fantastic. I, you know, you I, I genuinely never made this for a goal other than telling a good story. So I'm extremely happy that this has happened and feel very lucky. And so deserved. Absolutely. It's so deserved. Yeah. It really, Absolutely. it really is. It really is. And Charlie, quickly, as far as you're, you, you've been a BAFTA breakthrough Brit, haven't you? And I wanted to ask, what what's that meant to you? Is that you know helped? Um, you know, what have you kind of learned from that? What what encouragement have you had from that? How significant has that been? Oh, it's been yeah, it's it's amazing. Honestly, the breakthrough thing is one of the best things I've ever done. I think um, it it's just wonderful, like because you know you become part of the the kind of. BAFTA family, which sounds a bit naff, but it's true. And the support that, that um, you're given, um, it doesn't just last that year. I'm, you know, still in touch um, with with Claire, which I think Claire is fine with, who runs the programme. Um, but yeah, you you know, in terms of mentoring and people, you know, being put in touch with people, you might be a bit nervous to approach or it's just, it's just a, it's just a really amazing um, thing to do, basically. Um, yeah, I think it totally changed my life. Fantastic. Well, at this point, I have to awkwardly say goodbye to Naomi. For the time being, we'll be back later for audience questions. Naomi, Lucy, Ed and Carmel, goodbye. Okay. And Charlie, you're staying with us. Thank you. And yeah, sorry about that. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> and if we could meet um, Destiny Akaraga, who's directed episodes five through eight, and who's also a Breakthrough Brit. Welcome, Destiny. Yay! Hi. I think there's four, of, there's, I think there's four of us. I think it's me, Destiny, yeah. Alex and Jess, I yeah. think. Incredible. Oh, wow. Yeah. And talking okay. of which, let's and let's meet Dominic Buchanan, exec producer. 
kind of uh, envious of the fact that I'm not a breakthrough Brit now. I might... <laughs> There's still time, maybe. I don't know. I, I, but you have got a poster of the show in, in the background, which is which yeah. is clever. Nice. Very nice touch. And let's meet those other breakthrough Brits. Jessica Barden. Hi, Jessica. Uh, hopefully. Hey. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. And Alex Lawther. Hi, Alex. Hi. Hey, Alex. Hey, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a reunion, isn't it, for those of you who actually made the show. Um, <laughs> Jessica, let me start with you. From Going from series one to series two, was it, did you feel you knew the character now entering series two? Or when you read the scripts, you think, oh my God, this is a whole new place we're going. What was your feeling about that move from one to two? Um, I mean, first of all, like the whole thing to like come back and do the second series, like even when I think about it now, it makes me feel like so excited, but just so nervous at the same time. So, I mean, I think it was basically the same for me and Alex. We were really scared about it and also I mean I don't know like it was just such a lot of pressure and then reading the scripts it was so comforting to see that Charlie had taken it in such a different direction um but yeah it was extremely nerve-wracking because I think especially I mean like we just spent a year with people asking us if James was alive which is like a fairly like <laughs> surreal situation to then you know be like oh and you know Alyssa on the whole is like a, a pretty unlikable character it was nerve-wracking if people were going to try and relate or would want to relate to the the layers that had been added in the second series where she's definitely more vulnerable and if people would you know, want to watch that. It was just a crazy experience. Let's talk about the likability thing, because it is a thing that, that people bring up. I mean, I think she's, she, she feels incredibly human. And there's a great line in series two, I think in the Chinese restaurant scene where um, Alex says, Alyssa could make a room feel colder than it actually was. Is it I like that line. A great line. Is it hard to, to kind of humanise that, to make that real, and yet at the same time be a, a three-dimensional human? That we care about. I think, I think like at the time, I mean, also you can be nervous about every single job before you do it, but you know, you always just kind of hope that once you get there on the first day, but you're lucky if you have this and we definitely had it with our show on both series, you know, once you're there at like 10 AM on the first day and you've done the first scene, all of these things that you're thinking about as yourself at home when you're reading it and like, Oh, this is like, this is such a crazy line to say when you're doing it, the hope is that you're never thinking about things like that. So I, you know, you're not aware of it when you're doing it at the time, because then, you know, I wasn't trying to play an unlikable character. I just trusted the work that I was given. And, you know, I really don't like to overthink acting. So I just kind of like turn up on the day and do it. And a lot of the stuff, especially with this show, once I watch the series back, then I notice things like that again. So I just don't really think about it at the time. And Alex, for you, going from series one to two, what was, did you did you feel did you feel kind of confident that you you knew this character now and that you know and that he was going to take you into new places? I mean, he, he, the the change from where we first meet him in series one to by the end of series two is pretty huge, isn't it? Mm, and that was a real gift of the job for me was to have. I mean, I've not done anything on telly before and to have that length of time, but also a writer like Charlie who trusts um, in the time and that a story can be told sort of bit by bit, although the episodes are only sort of 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Um, and it was the first time coming back to a character and that was just so wonderful. It's like, I, I, I already was in love with so much of um, so many of the characters of then the world season one and the people making it to come back to it just felt like uh, yeah com coming back to I don't know school after a, a long holiday and seeing all your friends again and um, yeah it was a it was a real pleasure and then also meeting new friends I mean Destiny and Naomi and um, and Lucy uh, 
but with this sort of thread running through of these the, these characters that um I I felt so attached to, yeah. And Charlie, did you when you were um writing series two, writing for these for your characters, did you talk to Jessica and Alex at all about the way it was going to go about the trajectories of their characters and what you were going to get them to do in the series, or did you just write it and then deliver the script? Yeah, no, it was. Well, I think we, Dominic, I'm trying to think, did we have, I think it was a case again, we had outlines for maybe six, seven and eight, but they weren't written yet. I think there was stuff that, so it's that awkward thing where you're like, yeah, there is an ending. It probably is this, but it might. So yeah, we, we were pretty set on on where they were going to end up, but there were a few things to iron out, um, which is a bit nerve wracking. And you know, you, you want the actors to think you know what you're doing, um, which, you know, they are kind and have, have faith but I think um yeah we talked about where stuff was going I mean there was definitely a point where um Jess and I had a chat because there was a there were a couple of lines in like a final scene that she was you were rightly Jess just like I'm not sure that's right for Alyssa and you were you were totally right so again there were things that were collaborative and negotiated and and that's I think a strength of the of the of the team I, I hope I think people feel they can say that doesn't feel quite right to me which is um which is good destiny let me let me bring you in I mean, you'd worked on your own film and you worked that you directed that brilliant lenny henry um which was a story which was a 90 minute film wasn't it for bbc one mm -hmm. how was this um, in comparison cr directing these 20 minute episodes did you deal did you did you deal with it as little as episodes like that or did you deal with it as a kind of longer piece that you were directing as you did before i think when i uh, when I direct, I just take each day at a time. It's the only way I can do it without like having, without collapsing basically. Because if you start, if you look at a 90 minute script and you're like, I've got to direct all of this. It's like, I, I just, you're just not gonna, it's too, it's too much. So I take each scene at a time. I just, I treat, it might sound a bit wanky, but I treat each scene like it's its own because I come from short films. I started with short films, like most filmmakers. So a short film could just be a, a scene. And so I I took my um, experience in that and I, I carried that to features and I carried it to, I've carried it to televisions. If I just handle each scene at a time, then I, then I can, I can do it without getting freaked out by how massive it is. So um, my approach in that sense is completely the same. Um, and the, I, I, get, I, I will say though, I think, I think why End of the World was kind of different slightly from other TV that I've done is that it was coherent. Like I knew, not, that's not to say this, I'm not saying the shows that I worked on before are not coherent, <laughs> but let me just, like, yeah. like, let me just, I'm get in trouble already. What's it been like, five minutes? <laughs> um, I'm like, no, but like, it's like, I knew where it was going. So it felt like a film in that sense because I was doing five to eight and I was, I, there was a definite ending. I knew what was, you know what I mean? It felt that that was different. So my approach was, um, you know what I mean? Looking at the story, like it went from A to, to Z instead of somewhere in the middle. So that was cool. That was good to to do. And then, and then the way that I work with actors is, is the same on film as it is on, on television, which is just, you just, it's just, you just got to get the performances really. And I, I was lucky because I had Jess and I had Alex and I had Naomi and they knew what they were doing anyway. So sometimes they just made me look good, but for the mo but, but sometimes we would have discussion. I mean, that's what was cool when you're working with actors that are wonderful and fun, but also very professional and, and really care about the characters that they're playing. That's what fed me because you can always tell when an actor doesn't care. And um, these guys, they really cared so that you could have discussions. And because it's television, you don't have like these two weeks of rehearsals or whatever that you would have with film. You are literally, sometimes you're figuring stuff out on set. So that's different from film, but in a way it's kind of more exciting. And it, it, it's like that. So sometimes, you know, one of the guys might say, can I try it like this? And it's like, yeah, shit, let's, let's go, let's, let's do it. And um, so yes, it's, it's kind of the same. It was kind of the same on this experience, for sure. With such a kind of visually striking show, so with, with its unique look and, and the whole tone of it, 
the way it's edited and the music, as we mentioned, it, was that exciting for you to kind of, if you could flex your directorial muscles with this particular show? Yeah, I mean, I thought the show has rules, you know, it had these rules that you could only use certain frames and you could only use certain lenses. And I actually found quite, a, there was a freedom in that, I think. Like, I like parameters, I If you give me like a blank page, I'm like, you know, before you know it, there's aliens are coming, you know? So like, <laughs> if I like to have parameters and, and sometimes have rules and, so once those rules were set, I was like, okay, we can do, we can only do this. Okay, great. Like what can, what can they do? What can the actors do in that frame? Because it's, it's all right having an adult frame. You can have an adult frame that looks, you know what I mean? Strikingly beautiful and, and stuff. But from experience, I know that that doesn't, and from experience of just watching stuff that looks sick, if I don't believe the characters, then I, I don't care how, I, I forget how, how nice it looks. So you have, the, you have the frame and it's beautiful, but I just, I think I was more focused on what the actors were doing. I was like, the, for the deep, it was like, can I see their eyes? If I can't see their eyes, then it doesn't matter that there's some sick shadow in the back. Like, I don't, I don't care about the shadow. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm like, so that's how, that's pretty much, that was my focus. But the rest of it was really cool. Like with episode seven, I knew that, you know, there was talk with the DP and stuff about it having like a sort of taxi driver feel or, and when I was with, with Anna, who was cut, she's the editor, she watched just a bunch of Quentin Tarantino stuff. That's all she, she just got her, her head in that so that when I was set, because she cuts as I'm on set. And then when she was doing that, she, 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 cause we've worked together before. So she knows what's already in my head. And so visually that was where we were going, especially for that episode. That was the episode that I was like, please don't fuck this up. Like it was that one. So yeah. <laughs> The look of that episode is extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, like the red neon and all of that, yeah. Right. Dominic, let me ask you, what's, with such a show, with all of these elements kind of coming together to create this unique time, what's the, what's, what are the biggest challenges of sustaining that and sustaining all, and sticking to all those rules, et cetera? Do you know, it's, it's, um, we're a victim of our own success and um, it's, it's such a wonderful journey to be a part of and, and um, have kind of, retroactively look back and see where we came from to where we are so you know you've heard other people talk about the rules that we set and and it, it was one of those things where going into season one we didn't know if a lot of these things would work we just felt very um very truthful in that let's explore this let's try this out let's do this in a way let's try and subvert certain expectations and stuff like that so you know it, it, in season one of course it, it, it ended up looking a certain way, sounding a certain way, feeling a certain way. But then you get to season two and you're like, well, actually we've got these rules, but how do we evolve, for example? So for example, the music, it's like, okay, we, we, we were able to have a great soundtrack with Graham Coxon and Matt Biffa, our music supervisor, but what else can we do? What else can we bring in to kind of further the journey and the characters? Because also there's new characters as well as um, Jess and Alex's characters, there are new characters. So, so the challenges, unfortunately, were self-inflicted. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we did a good job in trying to get through them. You did a great job, absolutely, 100%. And in terms of finding the directors and all of that, did you, what were you looking for in, in your directors? Um, are you looking for them to bring something new to it, or are you looking for them to, that, that, I guess, that balance between continuing, as you say, the challenges you've set for yourself and what they can bring? Yeah, and I think it's, it's kind of unfair because these directors who we, we met, and of course, Lucy and Destiny, you're, you're, you're asking them to come in and offer you something new, but also whilst telling them, but it has to look a certain way, you know, and, and, it, and it has to stay in, in the arena. But by the way, we're open to expanding the arena, but, but it has to stay kind of in the arena, you know. Yeah. And, and um, I think we're looking for, we were looking for people that, that, you know, what Destiny does so fantastically is she, she, she really, can get into characters and 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 work with actors in a certain way and and just just a connection and you know it's not that she doesn't have other skills and also that Lucy has and they complement each other but you're kind of asking people to come in and say okay well what can you offer us and we're sitting back and you know just with our pens and our hands and our notebooks and I think some directors couldn't like you can kind of tell the ones that don't really want to um, 
play by these rules that we'd set. Um, and the things that they they offer you aren't necessarily things that really keep the show ticking, that keep us ticking creatively. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's kind of tricky for, yeah. for the directors, but I think they did a wonderful job. Yeah. Uh, Jess and Alex, I wanted to ask you about the, one of the unique things about the show is, is that we hear your internal monologues and, and that happens, you know, within within scenes where you're both you might be playing against each other. Is that, how does that process work where you're, you have to kind of maintain your look on it on your face and you've got your internal monologue playing out that we can hear. Is that a complicated, interesting process? Alex, let me I'll start with you. Um, <laughs> it's a funny one because actually it's kind of a lifesaver sometimes because uh, it, they act as moments because the voiceover is put on afterwards in ADR and um, in the sound booth or in the sound studio after you've got into the edit with the film. And it's lovely because sometimes we'll get into that part of recording the lines and Charlie will have put something really smart in which makes, adds something else to the scene that wasn't necessarily, well, we weren't really aware of when we were playing it. So it's sort of, it's sort of a final, um, I don't know, a final, a final tool to bring certain things out in the story. Um, yes, yeah, so sometimes it can really save the day. If something was missing or something narratively, maybe like, you know, I didn't play the right beat, so then that doesn't make sense. It can sort of be papered over with um, Charlie's voiceovers. Um, <laughs> it's a lifesaver. It's a lifesaver. It's a weird, there was the first, I think the first day of the first series, and Alex so politely said to me, he was like, sorry, so can I just, so I'm just checking. So I'm saying this, and I'm thinking this, but actually I'm thinking a lie. And I and I was like, yeah, it's quite a lot going on, actually, isn't it? And it's, 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 I hadn't really appreciated how how hard and tedious it was. And he's like, because I just want to be able to to do it. And I was like, yeah, no, I, you know, sorry about that. Um, so... <laughs> It was a kind of, because I think with, with, and Jess will be able to speak more about this, but in the first series, Alyssa's always speaking truthfully in her inner voice and, and, and James is sort of dissembling and that, that swaps quite um, completely in series two. Um, so I'm not saying Jess had an easier job. I don't think you did, but <laughs> in terms of just the voiceover, I think in the first series, it's like, that's what she's thinking. Whereas James is lying to himself as well as the audience, if that makes sense. I really liked doing the voiceovers because you're supposed to be doing that anyway, you know, like you're supposed to be, <laughs> I mean, it, it's what you're supposed to do when you're an actor, like you have to be thinking about something in the silence. Um, I mean, you don't have to, but it, it helps if you do. So the added voiceover just helped to influence actually where your character is in the scene. Um, you know, like many jobs do that where what you're saying isn't actually what the character is, what the dialogue is, is conflicting where that character is in the story. Um, you know, you have to do that on lots of jobs, but actually having the audience hear it, it, it helps. Um, I, I enjoyed it. I mean, just, just because you're supposed to be doing it anyway. So I always thought that it was just like a cool thing that I like doing. And also it meant that when we did ADR, we could really see like all of the series before it was ready. So it was, <laughs> it was good. When you're doing that process, when you're doing the recording of the voiceover and you're looking at yourself, you know, in effect, essentially you're, aren't you, you're telling us what you're really thinking. Particularly, I think um, Alyssa where she might be being really harsh in the scene that we're watching, but actually you, you hear what you're thinking and then the vulnerability comes out. Is that an interesting process when you're looking at your performance for yourself? Yeah, I loved it because, you know, that's, it's something that I try and find in, I like characters that conflict themselves and contradict themselves. I actually contradict is a better word. Um, they're characters that I like playing and watching people that are always, have some type of you know what their exterior is is not the interior just because it's way more interesting mm. for everybody to work on so yeah I loved it in series two I really loved the challenge of playing somebody 
that it well I mean I loved the the mental health stuff that was in it where you know I do think that the with the added voiceovers of the inner monologue it really meant that you could actually show that this person is like really fucked and like has depression or PTSD because that's the whole thing like on the outside she's just trying to repel everybody but on the inside you know she she's not well so I I liked it Mm -hmm. Charlie, you, you talked a bit about um, how you were still writing it till quite late in the day. Did, did you? Did you, <laughs> did you? Did you know? What, what point did you know you're ending? And, what, and did you did you change it around much at all, or did you think, yeah, this is how it should end? No, we knew. No, we knew the end. End. I think. I don't think there was. I was. Well, there was some discussion of should it be a tragic ending, and I was like, no, the world is bleak enough, and they've been through enough. Um, so I think we had a bit of back and forth on that, but I think on the whole, we were quite um, set on the fact that we wanted there to be this kind of gently optimistic ending and, and hopeful for both of them. Um, so I think the end was settled pretty early on. And the thing that unlocked it for me when we were at script stage was Emily Harrison, who who's at Clark and & Wellen and was, was working on the story learning, was just like, I think she needs to go back to the house. And as soon as she said that, I was like, yes that's that's episode eight and that's how it kind of that's how we will finish the the show and I think it was episode seven that was um a bit of a one we're like what happens in episode seven I don't know um something and then and actually I think that was the first draft that was like written in a week and was all a bit by the seat of our pants but actually I think turned into one of the best episodes of the of the series um but yeah that was a bit of a I thought I w might be fired at some point with that I was like I don't know what this anyway um but yeah did you know what, what you're gonna, did you know what you're going to do with the ashes the ashes scene which is which is both which I think sums up the show because it's so funny and yet moving at the same time just the genius of having the sludge of the ashes <laughs> yeah what, did... well for, for the eagle eyed people I think it's always like when did his dad get wet I remember Dusty saying that it's like is, have we done this? I was like, no, just a, just a conversation in the car or something. We don't need to. And like, I think people would be like, when did they get wet? No one knows. I was like, ah, oh, someone did spot that. But um, I'm not sure. I think, I think it, I think it came quite late. We knew he scattered them. I think at one point it might have been the wrong place. There was always going to be a, a kind of thing to undercut the tragedy of the moment because that's kind of again one of the unwritten rules of the show is that if things are teetering on being too sentimental or too dark, you want to try and pull it back to that line with a with some kind of joke. So it was never just going to be that he would scatter his dad's ashes and it would all be moving and, you know, it's like Alyssa's line being like, you should have done it here, sort of thing, carries on that whole, that tone, I think. And there, talk about, I think it's brilliant, it is an optimistic ending, isn't it, that you show that, you know, when the series starts out, you're thinking these some of these people are, borderline psychotic or whatever you want, whatever word mm. you want to use. And then in the end, they're very human and they, they're they dealing with their traumas, et cetera. Is that something that was very important to you to, to play out in that way? Yeah, definitely. I think with all, you know, all of the characters that, you know, I think you're right, you can think they're psychotic. They're just all really damaged and there's not, they're not bad. You know, Bonnie's not a baddie. She might be the antagonist, but she's not, um, she's she's so damaged as well and she's sort of I remember Lucy saying you know she's 10 years more fucked up than they are um and she works she sort of functions as their antagonist and also at times is a cautionary tale I think in, in their evolution um but yeah definitely felt I think it was a I think particularly the way the world is at the moment I didn't want to write or watch something that was just like yeah now everyone's dead and there's no hope and I think I think where possible it's nice to have a hopeful ending, but maybe I'm just very sentimental, I don't know. No, it was great. No, you're not. No. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> well, you are as well, Destiny, so we're just- I am, uh, yeah, no, like, <laughs> I was just like, where's the happiness? <laughs> no. but I, th I think one thing I'll say, and then maybe this reveals too much, but I think to your point, Charlie, you know, we, we, we felt the audience deserved that type of ending. You know, they'd been on that journey with us for, for two seasons. So they kind of deserved James and Lisa to come back together in certain in a certain way. Hmm. And I hope it's it's not so concrete, you know, it's tentative and mm -hmm. they're just gonna try and start something. It's not like it's all wrapped up and it's perfect, but it was I think it was important to have a kind of yeah, shred of something hopeful. I loved it because it was the beginning. I think when you when you end anything, when you end a film or a TV show, or whatever, on a beginning, as a beginning, I think that's always dope because 
what you you don't want to get to the end really what you're enjoying is the journey right and then you, you they, they're on a journey to get to a place and once but don't say that because place, then we're getting series three series three chat. oh no, 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 we don't no, want to do that finished, guys. It's finished. There's no it's the beginning of nothing it's the beginning yeah, of exactly. nothing yeah. <laughs> but i just like the fact that the characters were gonna they took the i i love watching a character take the first step to making themselves better and I thought that's what was beautiful about the ending is that both of them accepted the fact that they're damaged, but loved each other regardless. And that they were going to take that step by themselves, which is important that Alyssa says, you know, for me, it was very important that she says, but I do need mental, I need help with my mental health. So this can't happen right now, but of course it's going to happen. And that was very important for me because I, I don't like shows where the woman is saved, someone comes and saves her. I, I just, I always need the woman to save herself in a way. So I mm -hmm. thought that was written beautifully. And I thought Alex and Jess were beautiful in that scene, it was wonderful. Yeah. Desi, before I bring the, the, the rest of our team back for the audience questions, what were the biggest, what was the biggest challenge for you in your, the episodes you, you directed? And what, what, what was kind of, what, what one did you think, oh yeah, no, this is, I've, I've nailed this. It was a hard challenge. Seven. But, Ep seven without a single doubt. Ep seven without a single. Let me tell you, yeah. <laughs> on that set, that that episode, I think we shot it in four. I think it was four days. Was it four days? Just I think it was four days, right? It was four days, but the explosion happened in about four minutes. Like four we minutes, literally right? had that, two goes at it. That's what it was. It was crazy. I remember, like the the the. <laughs> Jesse was just guys, rocking it. In. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, it was, I was crazy. I, was, so. I didn't even watch it. I literally, <laughs> they came in first with the visual effects things. To it, spoiler alert, if you haven't watched it, spoiler spoiler now, right? So when Bonnie shoots them both in the head, obviously they've got like these packs on and stuff, and there was talk about these packs, right? And they were like, Destiny, Destiny, we've got it, we've got it. Come and see it, come and see the test. So I was like, oh, wicked, because me, blood, guns, you know, let's go. And I went out and they did the test and the blood just kind of just went like. Yeah, it like wasn't that. great. It was just like this underwhelming. So I was like, oh, this is when the panic attack, but you know, I've got to be professional. So I was trying to keep it behind this, but inside my, my I was just like, it don't work. It don't work, it don't work. Like I was literally, and they were like, no, D, don't worry. The blood's going to be better. It's going to be better. So as I'm trying to, we're trying to, because the schedules are so tight. So we're trying to get all the scenes done, you know, like, like that, right? Then we finally have about four or five minutes at the end to get this, but we've got one shot to get it right. Like, because there's no time to go and refill up the pack and all of them kind of things there. So I'm like, I'm talking They to, had to I'm sell to the set. You know they what I mean? To like <laughs> sell the set to complete the rest of filming the next day. Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we couldn't do anything. So I'm like, Jess, you know, you're good, you're cool. Yeah, Jess is like, yeah, ready. You know, Alex is like, you cool. I'm like, Alex is, yeah, yeah. Naomi's cool. I'm like, you cool. Okay, great. I go to the monitor. I'm like, great, we're going to do this. By the monitor, I'm praying. I've never prayed like that on set before. I was like, please, God, please, please. God. But I didn't know people could not see me like literally doing that because I was so, we had only one shot and then they did it. And I just let the camera run. I just remember, just let it, do not cut. Just don't cut. Cause I just wanted to see how long I could hold it for. And when I said cut, I was like, that was it. That's when I was just like, oh fuck, we, we, we did it. And in the, in the edit, no matter how, like I was there. So how can I still be surprised? No matter how many times I watched it, every time they got shot, I was like, no, no. And it's like, I know. Like I was there, like I know what happened. So for me, it was, it was, that was the big, and also I got to quickly slide in and just give Charlie some props here because maybe this is like demystifying something, but the end of episode seven was actually different. It was a different ending. Oh of that yeah, episode. it was. It was different and it was still dope. Don't get me wrong, it was dope, but our schedule was so tight that it was becoming apparent that because it was quite big and it was complex oh, yeah, and it had yeah, lots yeah. of extras, you know, and I was just like, you know what, what this is not going to happen. 
with the time that we have, it's just not gonna work, it's not gonna happen. And Charlie was so safe, and this is what I love about film that I haven't really experienced on television before. So it was, it was stopped, because with film, I'm always working with the writers, but in television, not so much. With Charlie, it was like I was still on a film. So I was able to just go straight to Charlie. I didn't have to talk to all of these people, you know what I mean? And I was like, it's not gonna, we don't have the time. And Charlie was like, tell me what I need to do. That, and for me, that's all I needed to hear. So I was like, we, we need to change the scene. Charlie was like, hmm. About two, I got home and I was like, I don't know what we're gonna do. And then there was a new ending in like an hour or something. And it was perfect. And I was just like, this is better than it was before. And <laughs> for me, I was just like, it was just one of those wonderful moments of when you've, you know you've got a team, you know you've got a dope team, and you know you don't have people that just serve you panic. Because I've, you, you, I've been in experiences where people just serve me problems but no solutions. And I don't want to hear problems if you ain't got a solution. And Charlie was just like, done. And it was, it was, that was, for me, that was the biggest challenge. And it was done in, in, in under an hour because obviously because Charlie's ex, extraordinary, ta extraordinarily talented, but lots of people are extraordinarily talented. Not a lot of people can work under duress though and just offer, like offer help like that. Um, and so for me, I was just like, oh shit. Okay, I've got a real one here. So that was, that was good. That was, that was nice. That's amazing. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, while I bring back in our um, the rest of our team, Carmel, Lucy, Naomi, and Ed. Oh, Alex, do you want to say something? Oh, you're pointing out the. I was just, I was just celebrating. Sorry that. They... Oh, good. <laughs> let me ask. Before I turn to the audience questions, let me ask you, Alex, um, and Jess, and Destiny, particularly, how what the, being a, a BAFTA Breakthrough Brit has meant to you? Has that has that how has that helped you in your in what you've been doing? Alex? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, it was when I was just sort of starting doing uh, television and film and it was lovely because uh, they put you in touch with um, other people who were more experienced than you are in the industry. Um, and it's lovely because you can talk about what you're worried about and have a cup of tea with someone and they tell you, yeah, I've been there too. There's nothing to worry about. You know, that's just, that's just part of it. Um, so yeah, and that helps foster, I think, a sense of community, which um, otherwise is sometimes can, can feel a bit lonely within sort of quite a huge industry of, you know, international thing. And uh, yeah, so for me, it was definitely that, which was um, my biggest yes. take. Um, I got mine about two years ago. So it, it sadly came at kind of like a crazy time because I, was just beginning to work a lot. So I sadly didn't get to do a lot of the really incredible things that they put in place for you that Alex um, discussed. Um, and I wish I had been able to, but it just wasn't possible for me that year that I had it. But um, I could see all the things that they had in place. And, you know, it really is a great thing to be a part of and I I just wish that I could have been able to do some of them but you know on the whole regardless it's fantastic to be um recognized by somebody you know by a group of people that are so influential in the industry and have them you know just think that like you're doing a good job is great and destiny what is it meant for you um like at the time much like Alex actually at the time that I got it I think I had done I think I'd made short, I don't know if I, I can't remember now if I'd made my uh, feature or not yet. Yeah, maybe I had, I'm not sure, but I do remember at the time that I was kind of miserable. That I do remember because the industry wasn't as open um, to me as I would have liked it to be. And so uh, it was a friend of mine that nominated me to, to sign up for it. And I was like, why? You know what I mean? What's it gonna do? Like, it's, you know, what's it, what, what's it gonna do? And she was just like, but because she nominated me, I, I, I did it. And I remember I was so miserable on one particular day. I got an email saying that I was part of the best of Breakthrough Brits. And I was like, oh shit, that's all right. Like, I just remember just saying, that's, that's, that's all right. It was just nice to be recognized. And I think people underestimate like how, important that is for someone just to give you a pat on the back especially when you're going through it because it just encourages you to keep it moving 
Um, so yeah, no, and also the as Alex mentioned, the mentoring and stuff, because I met, I got to meet some pretty dope people that I wouldn't have been able to meet otherwise. And um, and and people were really open to whoever I, I said I wanted to meet. They were like, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll endeavor to make that happen. And um, just really supportive and still support because I think this is like. I can't do maths. So I'm sure it's like over five years. I really can't do maths. It's, that's real. So I don't know. It's a few years ago now. And people, if I still reach out, like Claire will be like, yeah, I'll, I'll try to do what I need to do. And so it's been a massive support. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful. I'm grateful to Claire, especially because she's been a real champion. She's, she's the truth, man. So I like her. Great. Thank you. Right, now we're going to the audience questions. We've got Joe Oliver asks Charlie, if it hasn't, um, did you deliberately work to make the characters, particularly James, more sympathetic than in the original graphic novel? Ooh, um, I don't, I, I always found James quite sympathetic in the graphic novel, um, but maybe, I think that's probably thanks to Alex's performance. I don't think there was a kind of, what do you think, Ed and Dominic? I, I feel like- You're right, I think it's Alex's performance. I don't think we had a, a, an actual discussion about trying to make him more sympathetic. I think we just ran. Yeah. I think what we what we did was um, to try and contextualize his emotional backstory a little bit. So we did invent yeah. a few things to try and understand how a kid could arrive at that in such a kind of relatively desperate place um, as as kind of fantasizing as a, about being a serial killer as a defense mechanism against you know like struggle a trauma traumatic upbringing and then we, then we were like what was that because it doesn't quite go into that in the in the graphic novel so i think that unlocks some stuff but yeah i i agree with um dominic and charlotte is also like the such a sensitivity and vulnerability to alex's performance cutting against some of the darker elements of the of the opening um series and beyond i think there's one thing we changed which was i think in the graphic novel if i'm right there is it's ambiguous as to whether james is kind of setting Alyssa up to be attacked by Clive. There's a moment where he suggests that she kind of lies on, and, and, and that was absolutely not something we were kind of implying in the series. So I think taking that slight moment of doubt away from it just made you feel a bit safer with James possibly, but um, I think that's the only thing I can think of that we actively kind of softened, but yeah. Interesting, thank you. Um, Jessica Hernandez asks, what, is, what was the most difficult scene to write and shoot, emotionally speaking, regarding Bonnie's journey? Guess I'll start with you, Charlie. The end of episode seven. No, because um, <laughs> uh, it was done in forty-five minutes. No, I, I think. Uh, I think. I don't know about. I don't know what the guys found most difficult shooting. I think I found the lipstick thing hard to write in one. I think there were loads of drafts of that, weren't there? Ed? Like trying to get because it was trying to make it weird and disturbing and human and to kind of understand where the mother was coming from and, and how Bonnie was responding to it. And again, that's one of the scenes where when watching Amy do it and in the audition and everything, you're just like, oh, she, she's made it something I didn't, I couldn't necessarily do on the page, if that makes sense. That's the scene I found hardest, I think, to, to write. And she ate a real lipstick. She did. did she she ate real oh, fuck, that was real? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shit, I, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was going to ask what it was made of. Yeah, so why, Naomi? Are you happy to eat the lipstick? I, I, I mean, we didn't I, make her. We didn't make I, her. I, <laughs> no, I was more happy to eat the lipstick than I was the oatmeal. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> although it had a bunch of scenes with her and her mum, and we'd made this like really tragic-looking, awful breakfast, and both of them just like. Pathetically, just not do anything they could not to have to put <laughs> like, literally in mouth. begging Lucy. I was like, one of you have to put the cereal in your mouth so no one wants to eat it. <laughs> no, also, lipstick doesn't taste of anything. No, like, we've, we've made up a bunch of like, we've made up a bunch of sort of you can make red chocolates, we've made up a bunch of sort of red chocolate lipstick things, but the sort of texture just didn't look as good as you chewed it. Like the production designer, Dick Long, we tested him eating real lipstick um, in the office, and then Naomi graciously agreed to do it for real. In the fact that we run out of lipstick and we had to go and get more lipstick from the makeup truck for her to chew on. <laughs> wow, that's that's impressive. Um, <laughs> Flo Whitlock asks, "This is to anyone. Can you put a finger on what makes the show such a powerful story? What sets it apart from other stories? It's really caught the imagination of so many people. 
Um, who wants to pitch in? Maybe to start with the producers. Ed, Dominic, do you have a view on what makes it so unique? I'm going to let Dominic answer because that question is too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know what? I, I, um, I've been thinking about this recently with the show and, and some of my other work and realised it's actually, and, and this is very simple, um, so forgive me, it's not something revelatory, but it's about humans interacting and it's about their truth when they interact and especially with, with, with our two main characters, um, of James and Alyssa, and just the, the, the honesty that's behind them. Um, because as it was kind of mentioned earlier, you know, in, in the first series, we talked a lot about how they posture. Um, so I think that, that that's at its core. You know, obviously there's lots of other things going on that's, that's helped make it successful as it is, but I think that's the, 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 the core seed. Yeah, I think that's pretty spot on. I, I, I totally agree. I think uh, I'm now going to talk because Dominic's said something. Yeah, yeah, spot on. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> I'm, I'm stealing his answer. Um, uh, yeah, it's these disconnected, these kids are disconnected. And I think a lot of kids feel like that these days. And, and we've been amazed and really humbled by how um, great the reaction has been around the world. And I think it's because every kid out there can relate to what it feels like to feel a bit disconnected. And adults as well. I remember growing up and it's like... We've all felt like outsiders sometimes, and if you if you deliver that on screen in a way that feels um, truthful, then I think people find that very satisfying and and um, uh, yeah, moving. Hopefully, um, anonymous and attendee asks Carmel, um, "You're one of the best casting directors in the business. What do you look for when an actor enters your room?" Who let my mum on the Zoom? <laughs> 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 Wow, cool. Uh, I think <laughs> I'm not I'm an actor, so I think that I've got real respect and admiration for anyone that can come in and, and, and do anything. Um, so it's not even necessary, necessarily a confidence that I look for. I know I think people assume that. I think just a vulnerability and, 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 a, and a willingness to play around and put up with my questions about, you know, where they got their shoes from and what did they eat for breakfast? Cause that's all I, you know, I care about people. I care about the humans uh, behind it also. Thank you. Yeah. Um, another anonymous question for Charlie this time, coming from an acting background as you did, I remember um, when you were in um, uh, Cuc B Banana, the spin-off from Cucumber. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah from Russell T Davis's classic show. Um, coming from an acting background, how does that feed into your writing process? Well, uh, well, I would hope, uh, I hope that it means that I'm up for stuff changing if actors don't feel, so a line is quite right. So, I'm, I mean, I didn't, I, you know, I was jobbing, I wasn't doing anything like what these guys are, but I do remember the frustration of going, oh, that line just doesn't feel right. I wonder if I could change it. And so I hope that I kind of come with, with that spirit when I'm writing stuff for actors. Um, yeah, I think maybe that's the main thing, I think. Thank you. Um, another anonymous attendee asks, what was the inspiration for the set design? Um, who wants to ask to that? I noticed there's a lot of green, shades of green. Lucy, what are you doing? Well, I mean, there's the set, I mean, we could talk, I mean, all sort of, oh God, I'm just literally waffling. <laughs> um, I mean, I can talk, I mean, there's so many different, you know, each set was, each set had its own sort of tone and so it's sort of, it's hard to sort of talk about it as a whole other than, other than, you know, if we're talking about the world, then, you know, everything has this sort of Americana feel. Um, it was sort of like that non-distinct English town. You never really, you never, you didn't really want, you never, I never wanted to see like an English signpost anywhere. You never really wanted it. So you just didn't really want to know where you are. And then it's that sort of, you know, what decade are we in feeling? Are we in the 1970s? Are we late 90s? That sort of, um, it's making sure that that sort of, that thread through it all, um, because I think that sort of, that sort of heightened world was so much a part of, of the show and just making sure that that continued through. Like, I mean, the diner, for example, we, we just couldn't find, we couldn't find a diner because um, it was, you know, it was, had to be literally in the middle of a forest and funnily enough, there aren't many around. Um, so we ended up just building one from scratch in the middle of the Forest of Dean. Um, and that was sort of, you know, we sort of brought in references, you know, we looked at a bunch of American um, diners and we, we 
we sort of, but we needed it to feel like it belonged to the environment. So we ended up, there was like this sort of shack that we sort of, we'd seen through initial sort of location scouting. And that was sort of that sort of part of that. But anyway, I'm really waffling. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it back. But ultimately um, <laughs> the, main, the main through was, um, you know, that Americana, we don't really know where we are feel mid-century yeah. yeah. uh, there was there was i remember when we wanted a diner and i was like oh, i've seen one there's one in a garden center near my parents house in kent and everyone was like that's nowhere near anywhere else we're filming i was like well it's there so <laughs> that was that was my contribution really helpful and it's still there so wow whereas um, the, the diner that we built isn't there anymore it literally got packed up <laughs> oh it's so it, i love that diner i want, I want to be in yeah. that diner. yeah yeah it's great it's great um, uh, another question um, for Charlie. Do you write a lot of the physical descriptions into your characters? How do you approach this in order to enable diverse casting? Um, well, I think that, and I hope we're, I think we're moving beyond this now, I hope so. I think, you know, Carmel spoke a bit about this earlier. Um, like, I think there's, there, there has been an assumption that if you don't write um, someone's ethnic background next to the name in the casting, people are just going to assume that the character's white. And so then you have to specify when they're not white. And I think we should be, you know, I, I don't think that's the way things should be. And I think also with, with Carmel casting and the way she, the approach she takes, like you're never going to see just white actors coming in for roles ever. Um, and, but in terms of like physical descriptions of, of characters, I think, no, I think you. I think you wait and see that the actors who come in, and then and and that's. I don't come out. What do you think? Yeah, I think a lot of it was tailored. We'd get the scene. There'd be a brief description. I'd put it out to everyone, um, and I think that there was a. We'd see what we'd get back, and then kind of tailor it based on that. I think the one thing that we did do that was really um, great is we did. Uh, I don't know if you, well. There was, there, you know, when we did the um, kind of open audition to see actors with disabilities, uh, and that was like a effort on our part to um, open things out as broadly as possible. But we didn't want it to feel tokenistic. Um, Great. Yeah. yeah. That was. Yeah. It, it didn't quite work in a scene that we were thinking for an actress that we really liked. But um, yeah, we. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, a question for Naomi. How did you approach working with Alex and Jess as they were so established? <laughs> I think, I think like having seen them already perform, I had an idea of who they were obviously. And then like when I met them in person and like we all got along, I was just like, oh, okay, cool. Like the main thing is to feel comfortable with the people that you're playing with. And, um, they're great, like they're fantastic actors. And then they're just like also wicked people to have a little dirty laugh with. So um, yeah, we just like, I feel like there was just like a level of like understanding of the script and then like getting to know each other that allowed us to then just bounce off each other. And that it just, it created like a really cool atmosphere I felt. Me and Alex are like fairly just like boring people. Like <laughs> we we never like you know we with this series as well. Like we were never like there was no feeling of you know nobody from the first series had any type of I don't know. It was completely like level playing field. We were never like introduced to anybody like this is Alyssa and James. It was just like <laughs> you know. We're fairly, you know, just like simple and extraordinary people in real life. So it's not really, it, it wasn't really that situation. Uh, it was with you. Um, <laughs> um, actually, Jess, I've got a question for you from Luna Mavis, which I was going to ask myself. Was it hard filming almost the entire season wearing that wedding gown? Yeah, like, yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, I mean, no, I don't mean this is like any disrespect to Wales because I come from the north where people constantly say bad things about the weather, but it did rain in Wales a lot. And I'm sure that it's really beautiful there the rest of the time, but it was it, it was so wet 
and the dress absorbed whatever it was in. Um, <laughs> so, like, it was definitely um, an exercise in patience, which is never a bad thing for one to be subjected to. So I embraced the experience as much as I could. <laughs> That's a great answer. It was, um, it was really cold. And so Jess had to wear like sort of special leggings under the dress. We literally stuck hot water bottles all over her on her skin. She had this, ma so she was, we we're just constantly trying to keep her warm. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, I've got a question from YouTube from James Munson for Alex. What was your thought process when approaching James's evolution as a more confident and contented character? From season one to two. I'm not sure he was that confident content, but what's your feeling about that, Alex? Yeah, I think I agree with you, Boyd, that it, 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 there was a sort of uh, change of perspective as to how he felt about Alyssa, and so his sort of um, objective, um, speaking in sort of technical terms, like became slightly sh shifted slightly, uh, and that was really interesting um, because he didn't start season two. He'd, he'd He'd already suffered a lot of things when we meet him in episode two of season two. His dad has died and he's gone through uh, uh, a physical rehabilitation, um, but he's in a sort of a sort of grown up place. But he's now put his affections towards Alyssa in again a sort of not particularly healthy, much healthier than the psychopath stage from season one. But still, he's still got... Um, something else to learn um, about love. Um, and yes, I really, I love that. I love love stories. So I just, yeah, I was really delighted that it was, that was still the center of James's story as it had been for me in season one too, was finding out how to love properly. Yeah. Um, I thought that was so hard what you had to do. And obviously because we didn't film our introduction episodes together, I had no idea how Alex was playing that, but I really had so much sympathy for Alex because in the first series, you know, the huge thing of him was like, he wanted to kill someone. Like he actually was, Alyssa came into his life because he wanted to kill somebody and he was interested in killing Alyssa. And I was really, you know, I was just like so blown away by how Alex completely took on the fact that James was he had such a different set of priorities and a completely he had empathy in the second series which is like you have to do that really carefully and I was I don't know I think that Alex had a really hard job to do that because his version of his character was so different in the second series than the first one yeah absolutely yeah um, we've got a question for you. Actually, we've got two more questions. One, first for you, Jess, which is um, from Jean-Gabriel on YouTube. I was really touched by Alyssa's sadness, which felt particularly vibrant. Just he said there was no rehearsal. Well, I don't know if you said no rehearsal, but um, how did you manage to get there? Were there a lot of takes? And was there a rehearsal? Um, I think that we did, we did a day with Lucy. I mean, also, yo, like this show, I feel like we say it a lot, but I try and say this in interviews all the time, but they never put it in. Like the show really is like a tiny show. There isn't a lot of money, um, but I think it's also what makes English TV really great. It's totally made just doing it. So we had a day with Lucy and Destiny to go over things and just discuss things, which is just as good as like rehearsing for a week, really. So we didn't get to rehearse scenes, you know, specifically. Of course, you do a line run before. Um, but, you know, that, that was it. And everybody took that on and was great with it. And that was just the reality of making the show. Um, I don't feel like we did a lot of takes of things because, again, the size that the show is, you just don't really have that luxury. Um, you know, but I this was the second time that we had been working with Charlie and with the producers. So when you're an actor and you completely trust the people, the material that you're doing, you know that it's going to be fine. And we all loved both directors and the crew around us. So I think in terms of doing sadness, which, you know, is, is hard because you have to be really vulnerable. 
Um, we just were very comfortable on set, which makes those scenes easier to do. And all of the crew around us, you know, it really did have a family feel to it. So you don't feel as weird being like, okay, I just have to like go and stand in the corner because like I have to cry in the next scene. Like it's fine. Um, we benefited from the the atmosphere with all of those scenes. Yeah. But it also is it is a skill as well. They, it, we try to create these environments and stuff. But if if you're not good, then it what doesn't matter how cozy the environment is. And these lot, like Jessica, Alex, and, and Naomi, are extraordinary. Uh, close your close your ears because they eat. I don't want you not to like. <laughs> but the, they're extraordinary performers. They're extraordinary actors. There's a real skill to it, and they brought that. They brought. They came to set prepared. Yeah. Like they weren't, there was not one time where the, they didn't know what they were doing. And if there was any slight sort of like, wait a minute, are we supposed, then they said it. And nobody was festering in the corner going like, oh, I'm just gonna do it. It was like, D, what's up? Like this, what, how, how are we, and we would just quickly discuss it, which is, and just as right, is almost as good, sometimes even better than rehearsal because you're on the fly. Yeah. Um, but it is, it is them, these guys as well it's the, they're ex extraordinarily talented it's um yeah i just keep feeling i just like what, what else can we do like that's literally how i spend my days especially in 2020 so um, <laughs> yeah. of which that's a great the final question a great final question from marialina on youtube is now that we're in the middle of a global pandemic it really seems like it's the end of the fucking world as storyteller how do you all how do you stay focused and creative these days i'm gonna get charlie to answer that um, well, I think this might sound a bit sort of wanky, but I think there is, everyone's like, oh, everyone's working from home. It's like, no, it's a pandemic and you're trying to do some work at home if you can. And I actually think it's really important to not put pressure on yourself to be getting stuff done or being really creative. Because yes, there's loads of people learning a language and learning how to bake and that's great. I'm genuinely pleased for them. Um, <laughs> I am and I have to make, you know, a mean loaf no but the point but that's, the point is like there's so much pressure like well I've done this I've got this amazing idea and some people just don't function well in lockdown at all and some people have you know bad mental health as a result of it and so I think it's important to take the pressure off and do things that you know make you feel like you could be creative um like you know I've been reading lots of other stuff um written by the people watching lots catching up on things but I actually the best advice is to is to try and be nice to yourself and 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 look after yourself actually is the most important thing because creative stuff will happen again. It's fine. Yeah. I love that. that's, a, that's great. Thank you. Um, we have run out of time, uh, unfortunately, but I want to thank you all. Um, Charlie, Destiny, Dominic, Lucy, Ed, Alex, Jess, Naomi and Carmel for your brilliant insights and congratulations on the nominations. Um, the uh, Virgin Media British Academy Television Awards will be on Friday the 31st of July. Um, and the TV Craft Awards are online. You can watch them online. I want to thank the supporting partner of the sessions, TCL. To the audience, I hope you've enjoyed the chat and please join the conversation on BAFTA social channels and stay tuned for details of where to watch the awards. And the next event in this series is the making of Leaving Neverland and Don't Fuck With Cats. There's a lot of fucking going on, um, which is tomorrow at 5 p.m. <laughs> please, please visit BAFTA.org to register to view. Thanks so much to all of you and thanks for joining us and thanks for your questions. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.